How does one dip their toe into Star Wars these days without feeling like they've just plunged into a sarlacc pit after being promised a water slide? Unless diehard fans are covertly hosting screenings of the original trilogy, meticulously preserved from ancient VHS tapes, the average newcomer's first impression of recent movies, streaming TV, and games is likely to be as thrilling as watching moisture evaporate on Tatooine. I can't be the only one who realizes that Star Wars is supposed to be pulpy science fiction, an easy-to-digest hero's journey. For crying out loud, the box art of the old movies is practically a guide on how to make it work. Rip nerdy guy holding a glowing sword while his oddly sexy sister stands beside him. It's not hard. George Lucas even figured it out. Yet everything that has come out of Star Wars for the last decade seems like it's written by the people who were raised on cartoon public service announcements. Lots of lessons, not much fun. Perhaps the mantra, Star Wars is for everyone, was a tad too optimistic. Maybe some things are better left to enthusiasts who treat personal hygiene as optional DLC and social interaction as a side quest they have no intention of undertaking. The ideal Star Wars fan is someone you cross the street to avoid, but their unwavering devotion can elevate niche entertainment into something you'll still watch, even when they stick the only female character in a bikini and have her make out with her brother. Star Wars would have been just another space flick if the most sweaty Among Us didn't first breathlessly tell everyone about it unprompted. But Star Wars now apparently belongs to me and you and everyone who likes Call of Duty and reality TV. So Star Wars is just another space flick now. We're just pretending like it still has the spirit, when it's devoid of anything that made it special in sometimes unsophisticated ways. All the uncomfortable weirdness has been scrubbed clean, elevated from its dirty niche, even if it was a particularly large niche, so regular people don't have to feel embarrassed when watching it. And I can't think of anything more mainstream and nicheless than a Ubisoft open world game, focusing on the morally gray criminal side of Star Wars instead of the grandiose battle between good and evil, which could have been the right direction to go in to avoid the problem I brought up with previous Star Wars. Wars games, that being nothing of consequence can actually occur in them. By the end, all the hero has done is preserve the status quo until Luke shows up. By focusing on an outlaw doing seedy things in the underworld, where their actions would likely never see the light of day or matter beyond some small importance, Ubisoft could have done something interesting instead of taking on the Empire by kicking at its shins and walking away feeling impressed with themselves. But this game couldn't even do that, and further bakes in its own irrelevance by sitting it in between the Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. What begins as a simple high story eventually turns into helping the Rebel Alliance accomplish some imaginary victory over the Empire. So calling it outlaws hardly equated to much, since you're still stuck playing the heroic sidekick the spotlight accidentally shined on. The main character, KVS, hardly screams outlaw either. There isn't a rogue bone in her body. In every cutscene, she stumbles her way through every criminal deal like someone who should be crafting latte art, not masterminding criminal heists. Slero is your main villain, because he has a mustache and wears a cape like they pull him out of a vaudeville cartoon. Not many railroad tracks that tie women to in Star Wars, though, I'm afraid. Each of you represents some of the most powerful criminal organizations in the galaxy. Pikes, Crimson Dawn, Huts. I'm not sure why Slero bothered preparing a speech, since he has all of them shot at the end of it. I wouldn't waste words on people who are going to be too dead to recall them. To my surprise, one of you sends a spy into my own house. Actually, Asara ends up being a Rebel Alliance agent, so where did Slero get the idea that he was sent by one of the other syndicates? And when you add in that Slero is secretly an Imperial Secret Police Director, tasked with finding rebels in the criminal underworld, the fact that one delivered himself to him, and he isn't even aware of that, is pretty damning on his competency. Aren't you listening? I'm starving. It's time to eat. What does killing the representatives of the gangs even accomplish? It's never brought up again. I Meaning this really was just a fancy mustache twirling moment so you know that Slero is the guy to be wary of. <sighs> Tank Farrick. Maybe you wouldn't lose your data spike if you didn't use it as a hairpin. Take some credits. For the data spike. <laughs> I'm good. What exactly does this say about Kay's character? She's too good to accept money from a friend, but then she'll go steal it from strangers one minute later to fix her slicer. Then I'll put it towards your rent. I said I'm good, Bram. Who would ever offer their tenant money that they can pay towards the rent they already owe them? Bram would just be handing Kay money that she gives right back to him. Because the forged identity cards in that vault are the only way I get off this planet. Kay needs her data spike in order to sneak into Club Tarsus and steal forged identity cards so she can leave this planet behind and make her way to the core worlds. Kay isn't wanted for anything right now as far as I'm aware, so I don't know why she would need a fake ID to travel. She apparently doesn't need fake ownership documents of the ship she steals, and she uses her real name wherever she goes even after she gets the fake ID. Ubisoft being the creativity vampire they are, fit every game into one of three templates. Assassin's Creed, Far Cry, and Watch Dogs. 
which is the one that appears to have been dusted off and turned into a Star Wars game. This game contains all the same bland elements, lackluster stealth that involves sneaking up on guards who have the patrol route of a toddler inside their crib and about the same visual awareness, easily knocking them out despite Kay being a waifish girl of about 90 pounds that can deliver haymakers and knock out helmeted men even when they see it coming. I cleared an entire sector of guards during an alarm as they would all file into the room I was holding down and be knocked unconscious like Kay was having her big professional wrestling career moment where every adversary enters the ring and is down with a single punch. Then you have the hacking, both computer and the environment. Kay can hack terminals by playing a game of legally distinct Wordle or with a beeping rhythm music game. But the environmental hacking is all done through her pet axolotl slash pangolin Nix. He essentially replaces a smartphone in a watchdogs game. Even when the AI is working, the game is piss easy. So easy that Ubisoft had to make most of the missions stealth only. So for half the game, whenever you sound an alarm, you get a game over. Because the AI is too brain dead to find you. And when it does, it breaks down and can't even shoot you. Stormtrooper aim goes up to 11 at times and they can't even see Kay in plain sight and shoot at the ground where they think she's standing. Uh, let me through. You're not on the list. Oh, my, uh, my friend Preven put me on the list. Jedis have oversold the usefulness of their mind trick. Everyone is so dumb that even Kay can bluff her way through conversations when she has the poker face of someone slowly dying to a brain-eating amoeba. Oh, come on, Preben. Your plans didn't have a pressure switch. Hey, Beth! Hey, Beric! Six Ken members recognize Kay and even yell her name, but she figures she'll be safe back at Bram's bar. He covers for her when they show up, but they think he's lying and shoot him in the leg. I guess he wasn't obviously lying enough like Kay does to pull it off. And then they just leave instead of continuing to search the place, when one of their people yells they think Kay is outside based off nothing. She was in fact up in the attic watching all this unfold. It's such lazy cutscene direction. You set up tension, have Kay's sort of father figure shot, but he's completely unharmed, and then the gang members leave after they confuse themselves. Whatever it takes, you finish this job. Score alone is enough to buy you a damn shuttle off world. Bram hands Kay a job he initially turned down but figures the pay is the only way to get her off the planet. He turned down that job this morning, yet the crew are waiting on someone to show up like he agreed to it. Who's the Mark? A boss named Slero. Runs a syndicate called Zarek Besh. They're new, they're rich, and rumor has it they've got the underworld scared. Were there no details on the data pad on this job? How did Bram even know to turn it down in the first place? And he didn't want Kay robbing Six Ken for a fake ID, but has no problem sending her a job to rob the vault of Slero, leader of the Zarek Besh, the most dangerous syndicate in the galaxy. Password override. I wouldn't toss small mission critical things like that around inside a moving vehicle that isn't covered as it flies through the sky. The wind alone might carry it into the void. Denyon, I'm at the vault door and there's this droid. You've met the TT-80. Good. Password is Grandio Cha. Why did they even need her for this? Did everyone in the Rebel Alliance suddenly develop a bad back and they can't crouch walk? They show up a second later after Kay frees the guy being held inside the vault. You're not Zarek Bash. What is this? Where's my cash? Uh, use a hand here. I liked Twi'Lex a lot more when they were a species of strippers and go-go dancers. Now they have no unique selling point. They're the perfect example of something being seen as harmful, so it was made boring instead. Let's get something straight. Harmful is better than boring. You either pay me now, or just pay me. We're the Rebel Alliance. So? I don't think the devs realize how terrible this makes the Rebels look. They trick Kay into helping them rescue Asara from Slero's vault chamber, weren't even planning on paying her, then stun her and leave her for Slero. And yet they'll continue spouting the line that they're fighting for everyone even though they know who Slero is and what he would likely do to Kay. Whenever Kay is knocked unconscious, it's treated as an opportunity for a flashback to when Kay was a child and learning her thieving skills under her mom, Rico. For this first one, Rico sent Kay to pickpocket knowing she would be caught, but wanting her to learn the lesson that you can't always count on someone being there for you. I thought at first this was going to be some bad lesson that was drilled into Kay by her mother that she would have to overcome, especially since she was just betrayed by someone and will be betrayed a few more times in the course of this game. But Kay has no problem trusting and relying on others and even spins the game's finale saving her partner's life. How long have you been part of the Rebel Alliance? So you did know Asara was a Rebel Alliance member. So why did you kill all those syndicate leaders after blaming them? What do the Rebels want with Zarek Besh? Given Slero's position in the Empire, he doesn't even need to question Kay about what the Rebels are after in his vault, since it should be very obvious to him. <laughs> those door control panels are a serious security weakness that the Empire needs to tighten up. They save so many Rebel lives. I want a death mark on her now. I promise a fortune for whoever can bring me her head. There'll be nowhere in the galaxy she can hide from me. 
Slero apparently doesn't care at all about the actual Rebel Alliance member he had locked up inside his vault that got away and places a death mark on Kay instead, which ultimately results in one bounty hunter looking for her, the one Slero personally hires, so her death mark must not be very high. I didn't even know her name to place a death mark on her. She has a fake ID card on her after all, and Kay never gave him her name. Kay doesn't know how to pilot a ship, but accidentally manages to get it started, fly into orbit and engage the hyperdrive to a random planet after pounding on the monitor, which she then manages to crash land on safely despite having zero piloting skills. As soon as she opens the hatch, someone else tries to kill her and she's attacked by raiders. How many gods hate this woman? I, uh, I thought you were one of them. Waka, the guy who took a swing at Kay, believes she was one of the raiders chasing him. Raiders who gave him enough time to make his way to a crash ship and stand just outside the door waiting for someone to come out. I'm having a hard time following his logic that a person inside a crash ship would be with raiders who were here to illegally salvage said crash ship. There's a pike underboss named Gorak. Talk to him. And he'll give me work. Got it. That speeder in your ship will get you to Miragana City easy. Waka turns out to be a mechanic, and he volunteers to fix Kay's ship, and then quickly moves on to ordering Kay around, telling her to go find work to pay for repairs and pointing out the speeder on her ship like he's already familiar with everything on board and knows it still works. Ubisoft may craft elaborate looking open worlds, but they fill them with tourist trap level objectives. All they're missing is an underpaid man in a suit flipping a sign in the direction you should distract yourself in. I play their games as if they were linear corridor shooters, making a beeline to the objective marker while ignoring all the HUD displays desperately trying to get my attention. Let me see some identification. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Your Torn Valerio Nup. That's me. Mm -hmm. This will be the only time Kay needs that ID she stole back on Kanto to enter this one settlement and it's never checked again anywhere else. I don't know you. But you seem important, so I will single you out for no other reason so we can keep this moving. You're new to this world. Come back when you're not. That means go do a bunch of missions to pad the runtime until I deem you worthy of continuing with the plot. And what do you know? Someone who wasn't even present in the room has taken notice of Kay's pet swiping Gorak's ring and wants to give her work stealing a file from Gorak's base, which ends up being nothing more than a Spotchka recipe. So Kay steals an encrypted file that has a holocron recording of a Pike member planning to betray Gorak while speaking with Governor Thornton, which she can sell to Gorak for money to buy fuel injectors. She got this file from Gorak's computer. I don't think he would pay you for it since he would be aware of it already. Recognize her? Because Zarek Best showed up with one of their best, asking a lot of questions. Yeesh. A death mark from Zarek Pesh? K being wanted will never matter, so I don't know why the game is making such a big deal out of it. You can keep the info about the Pike Trader and sell it to Gorak, or give it to the local Crimson Dawn leader, Alira. This is all a part of the game's faction system, where you gain and lose favor with gangs based on your actions. It's half-baked and never feels like it matters. It boils down to simply making a gang like you more so you can steal from them without using the game's stealth system. Some fuel injectors for that ship you don't have. These should help you get off Toshara. So you know everything, huh? Just the things that are important to us. Bram's leg is healing nicely. Alira knows about the fuel injectors Kay needs even though Waka is the only person besides herself aware of that. And she even knows about Bram being shot in the leg. The gulf between a competent fact finder and being omnipotent is pretty large. And better writers would realize that. But this is just the standard we live with these days. You got an ion blaster? I need someone to hit a stash for me, but you'll need one to get inside. The fuel injectors are not enough to fully repair the trailblazer, so Waka recommends Kay take on more jobs from Donka. Before Donka can give you the next job, Kay needs a modder blaster with an ion upgrade. The ion blaster was only so Kay could shoot a capacitor through a window of this abandoned shop to open the door. Meanwhile, Kay has a cute little pet that can crawl through gaps and open doors for her. I think she would have managed. I got some friends who could help you out. Get you a better slice and can rig that speeder of yours. You'll have to track him down yourself. I would never hire someone for a job if I also had to source all the standard equipment they would need. It's like hiring a plumber and giving him directions to the hardware store so he can buy a wrench. I'm on a job. What do you want? Oh, um, my name's Kay Vess. You know, you have a death mark on you. It would be in your best interest to not go around giving your real name to people. There are Imperial strongholds on the map that you sometimes have to sneak into. Alerting guards will see them try to call for backup but you can either stop them or disable the alarm. If you cause too much trouble in a base, the Empire will send death troopers after you. Several kilometers away from the base you are currently ransacking, who just sort of wait for you to come to them. I was warned that death troopers have been dispatched to kill me several times, but I never ran into any of the bastards. The game provides you a location if you want to go and deal with them, but for the life of me I can't think of any compelling reason to do so. 
The Splicer K is trying to find upgrade her gear, was splicing into an Imperial base when things went wrong and she sealed herself inside the garage. And the Empire, in all its galaxy-spanning, world-destroying power, has been unable to get to her for days. Despite this massive security breach they've already suffered, Kay snuck in and Ayla opens the door for her so she can deliver the sequencer. But she wants Kay to install it on the roof so she can take over the turrets and escape in a shuttle, and tells her to leave out the air vent, which I guess the Empire never noticed in their own goddamn base. You just have to sneak into an Imperial station and delete some data. The Crimson Dawn want Kay to sneak into an Imperial space station by posing as a cargo delivery so she can access the computer with the debt files Governor Thornton keeps on the syndicates. Apparently, he doesn't keep backups of his financial information, and this is the only copy. The Crimson Dawn only wanted Kay to scrub the Pike's debt to frame them, but you have the option of pinning the blame on Crimson Dawn by deleting their debts. Not that it matters. The syndicate affiliation mechanic doesn't come into play until the end game when one of them comes to your rescue. As she's trying to delete the files, an alien inside a jar, Bosnak, appears and demands Kay help him escape or he'll sound the alarm. He serves as Governor Thornton's accountant and has been planning to escape for a long time by preparing an extraction cruiser and then praying that someone would show up out of the blue to delete files so he could force to help him. I can see why he's been waiting for a very long time. I sometimes lay grand schemes just in case a pizza delivery man decides to show up at my door unscheduled. You planning on taking off anytime soon? The soundtrack is gonna run out of swelling orchestral music. They end up having to shoot their way out of the cargo hold and K, in only your second time flying, has to fight a squadron of TIE fighters and wins. Get close to the relay and I can wipe the system. Attention pilots! If you wipe the Imperial comms relay, the Imperial forces forget all about you, even the ones in the station you just assaulted and blasted your way out of. There's this old wreck buried in Amberine and it's loaded with compatible parts. It's not stripped already? Look, uh, I mean, we tried. The winds picked up and not all of us have fancy speeders. Then part of it collapsed and sealed it off. Kay still can't leave the planet without replacing the nav computer for the hyperdrive. Walken mentions an old High Republic ship that crashed here a long time ago that has a compatible piece of tech, but she needs to upgrade her speeder to reach it, which involves stealing an atmospheric accelerator from an Imperial wind harvester. Because apparently the Empire that built the freaking Death Star can't build a wind farm without contracting a local speeder tinkerer for a single piece of kit that shuts down the entire operation without it. I just, uh need a class 11 power core. Next, Walker requests Kay sneak into another Imperial base to steal a class 11 power core. The reason Kay needed a speeder mod was to drive down a simple tunnel that, as far as I can tell, has zero need for you to speed down it. And why couldn't we have just flown the trailblazer here and let Kay off? And the power core is used to open exactly one door on this torn apart ship, like there weren't several ways in. Kay even slides down an optional entrance on the way out. How did Walker get here without a modded speeder to get through that impossible regular tunnel? You're gonna kill me for a no. ship? Trailblazer. You're gonna kill me over a ship? Asked Kay Bess. Meanwhile, she's killed dozens of people over parts to fix said ship. Zarek Besh wanted you alive, but I can't afford any loose ends. Waka's idea of a trap was to send Kay to retrieve all the parts she needed to fix the ship, and then in the middle of getting the final piece, he would show up and kill her. He could have just shot her when her back was turned on board the ship if he wanted. Luckily for Kay, the bounty hunter Vale, working for Slero to bring Kay in, kills Waka. How did she find Kay all the way out here and also reach this unreachable shipwreck without a modded speeder? Kay manages to escape by randomly pushing buttons on the console behind her, which causes the ship to start shaking and a piece of the roof to fall and stun Vale. But Vale catches up. And then a droid, who also managed to track Kay down to this random location and made his way through the impassable tunnel without a modded speeder bike, saves Kay and tells her to get out of here while he detonates a bomb, which doesn't seem to accomplish anything since Vale survives his encounter, and Indy 5 never brings up what happened. Despite Kay being on a modded speeder, in D5 somehow managed to beat Kay back to her ship. This really is Lero's mansion, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And the schematics for a safe filled with 157 million credits worth of unmarked Beskar ingots. And I can get you inside. Why would you want to recruit someone who already failed to break into Slero's vault once before? And why would Kay want to take on the same job she already failed at and received a death mark for her trouble? Especially after she was betrayed and left for dead by the people who hired her to do it. And this time, it's harder. So she'll need to recruit a team of experts from around the galaxy. But Kay lacks the cognitive ability to have worries or anxiety, so she agrees. This job, it's a death wish. Well, you're already dead, Kay. Lero runs the most lethal syndicate I've ever seen, and he wants you gone. 
Sliro is a leader of one of the largest criminal syndicates in the galaxy, and secretly the director of the ISB on a mission to find rebels in the underworld. So why fixate on a nobody who stole an outdated starship of no real value? I don't understand the villain's obsession with Kay. I kept thinking there would be an explanation for it, like the trailblazer was secretly very important. But no, it's just an old ship that he really likes. ND5 has the list. Track him down. Get our crew. Oh, and don't stab me in the back. Andy's program to make sure that doesn't happen. How exactly could Kay stab you in the back? She's the one doing all the work while you advise. The most she could do is change her mind and drop out of the plan. Kay Vess isn't working alone. Before I built Zarek Bash, my family built ships on Corellia. I feel like Slero was going to go on this rant about his past no matter what news Vale reported to him. He seems like the type to strike up a villain monologue while sitting in the opposite restroom stall from you. I hire you because you are one of the best hunters in the Outer Rim. She tried to punch a combat droid in the face. But I guess Boba Fett was a little busy right now. So Slero had to go with the Disney approved hire. Then I tell you someone broke into my private vaults and stole one of the last EML 850s in the galaxy and you assumed... She was working alone. Well, she was working alone. She did all that stuff you mentioned by herself. And if that's what you think, wouldn't you have provided that information when hiring Vale for the job? Single world planetary biomes have been done to death. So now space around it has to reflect its weather. So you have to fly through a nice nebula that surrounds it. I'm going to point out that in space, water forms into spherical balls of ice, not pillars horizontally aligned with the planet they orbit. I wouldn't say I was surprised that the cantina would be a focus in a game called Star Wars Outlaws, but when Kay has to visit a cantina first thing on every world she arrives on, you begin to realize that they didn't have any idea what to do with the outlaw setting beyond what they saw Han Solo depicted doing. You can think a little more outside of the box than hitting up the local hive of scum and villainy to get information on the person you're trying to find every time. Every person Jalen picked for this heist is in some sort of trouble and need to be bailed out of it first before they'll join the crew. The explosives expert, Ink, is currently being held captive by the Ashiga clan. To gain access to her, Kay retrieves a stolen Ashiga clan relic from the Crimson Dawn and returns it. But instead of being rewarded for returning the relic they wanted back, the queen just offers Kay another job. There is zero reward for doing them this tremendous favor, except for more potential work. Before Kay can begin working for the Queen, she's contacted by the Queen's daughter, Krisk, who's in league with the leader of the Crimson Dawn, Kira, who I learned was a character in that Han Solo movie. They want to dethrone the Queen for aligning with the Empire. They even give Kay the location of Ankh in order to break her out. This only goes to prove that the outlaw alignment mechanic is ignored for the sake of key plot points. The Crimson Dawn hate me after I sided with the Pike and framed the Crimson Dawn for deleting debts. Yet the leader of the Crimson Dawn is very impressed with Kay and has heard good things from Alira, who I screwed over. If I enter any Crimson Dawn territory, they try to kill me. But here's their leader recruiting me for another mission, even when I have a history of siding against them. Breaking Ankh out of the Ashiga Weapons Factory is just a straight copy of breaking Bostock out of the Imperial Space Station, riding around on a hover sled as you press buttons to open doors for her. God forbid any of these characters be programmed to pathfind on their own, or do anything interesting like walk. That's how low my expectations are now. A friendly Ubisoft NPC being able to walk would impress me. That's why we need you. And cover all those puny coyotes to vent the Uber shopper off. Uh, this will be the first one. Twice. Hey, Nikki. Uber tempata mucha jainka bunga sif. Uber nabata grava. Anativa uber sabola bata. Chehaku duando babola. It was better when Jalen pitched it. The game is sending its own plot. It can't deny this is stupid. The queen requested you for a job. Let us meet. Uh. All right. Even though Kay just helped Ankh escape from the Ashiga, and Kay was the one who requested her from the Queen in the first place, the Queen doesn't suspect or even bring up any of this when offering Kay more work. Since Ankh won't take on another job until she's finished her current one, which is helping Chris go overthrow the Queen, Kay is stuck helping by sneaking into the compound through a blown tunnel to shut down the turret so Chris's people can launch an assault. During this, the Crimson Dawn members sneak in and head toward the Ashiga clan's origin strand their genetic code, which will give them effective control over the Ashiga. By rescuing it, Kay gets to decide who will take over the Ashiga. But she really shouldn't. Krisk already took the throne room and holds the queen hostage. Why even have her there in the room when Kay arrives so she can argue for her continued rule instead of Krisk's? I would lock her up in a room and demand the origins ran from Kay after I just fought and achieved what I wanted. It doesn't even make sense. Whoever controls the Origins Ran, the other Ashiga members will follow unquestioning. But the Queen held the Strand up until a few moments ago, and Krisk and her followers were against her. But if I turn over the Strand to the Queen, her own followers kill Krisk. Kira is still on speaking terms with Kay even after I sided with the Queen instead of Krisk. Her Syndicate members will still kill me on sight, however. 
K knows a droid smith on Akiba who can help them reprogram the security droid inside Slero's vault. She doesn't know where on the planet he is, but luckily they landed at the one cantina on the planet where people have heard of the guy. You'll find your Rodian at an Imperial research station. Of course he is. Where else would anyone be? Ubisoft has suffered from formulaic copy-paste mission design for decades now, but Outlaw's case is especially bad. Sneak into base, find person, convince him to join the team, sneak out. Not once does it mix things up, and sticks closer to the Ubisoft design document than a first-time IKEA shopper assembling their entertainment center. Gadeek has an android problem that he needs help with before he can leave the planet, but to help him fix it, K needs another upgrade to her speeder that lets her fly over water. So Gadeek sends K to his friend Turin, a mechanic who is under attack by Sarat's men. After dealing with him, he says he can install a hydro repulsor, but needs Duracell struts to keep it from shaking loose, and those were stolen by Sarat's men and taken to their island. So he temporarily installs a repulsor so K can reach the island, then chase the cargo shuttle back to dry land where she can take out the guys and claim the Durastil struts. The only reason K had to go through all that for a speeder upgrade was to pass a flooded area to reach another Imperial base. It's not like she doesn't have a ship that can fly her anywhere on this planet, not to mention you can't use the Hydro Repulsor speeder on any other planet except this one. The Viper drones Gadeek was forced to make for the Empire attack K at the coordinates he sent her in the jungle where she was to meet his friends. His friends turn out to be the Rebel Alliance, who want K to infiltrate another Imperial base to lower security so they can attack it and take the reprogrammed Viper droids. This is exactly what I just did for Krisk. I honestly believe even Ubisoft developers are tired of this slop they're forced to make. There wasn't even an attempt to do something interesting with his license. They could have just set a Watch Dogs game in Tunisia or South Africa and saved a lot of money not licensing Star Wars. To no one's surprise, you head to Tatooine. Yes, I'm still going to sin it, because meeting low expectations and easily predictable behavior isn't doing you any favors. Oss, the gunman Jalen wants for the heist, was arrested by a local sheriff but escaped. Hot Thug show up looking to collect on the bounty and are gunned down by the sheriff before she tells Kay there are two more coming, and what do you know, two more huts around the corner just so Kay doesn't feel left out of the murdering. As if the developers realize how boring it was to watch someone else be more badass than Kay, and had two more thugs show up just so you can gun them down and pretend like you did something. Inside the abandoned moisture farm where Haas was hiding out, Kay finds a dead bounty hunter with a working transponder that is apparently tracking Haas. Wouldn't you need a tracking device on the guy for this to work? Apparently the bounty hunter was tracking his own speeder, because that's what Kay used the transponder to find. After crashing the bounty hunter's speeder, Haas was taken captive by some Tusken raiders, who saw Kay coming and figured she would be perfect for getting their Krayt Dragon Pearl back from some raiders in exchange for Haas, since who else would Kay be here for? This world is way too good at making assumptions on what Kay wants and where she's going to be. Haas doesn't show up at the spaceport as promised and Kay finds him inside the Moss Eisley cantina gambling and losing. Since he doesn't have the money to pay his debt, he grabs Nyx and tosses him to the guy as payment. Then Kay is finally on the receiving end of a knockout blow herself, resulting in another flashback, this time revealing how Kay met Nyx while she and Rico were knocking over an exotic pet storage. It's a little too late for me to feel the bond between Kay and Nyx. I treat the little guy the same way Aiden treated his cell phone in Watch Dogs. Useful in a limited capacity, and kinda cute if he put the right protective case on it. When do we uh, get the hell out of here? Haas actually thought he still had the job after selling Kay's pet to Jabba and stuck around until she woke up. You've never met Jabba. I don't care. I've had dealings with him before. He is extremely dangerous, Kay. I said I don't care. Nyx is family. Well, you just gave away the very obvious inspiration for where Nyx came from, Lilo and Stitch. There's a back entrance to Jabba's palace near Moss Eisley. There's always a back entrance to every single location, even Jabba's palace. The amount of people left who are going to nerd out over Han Solo and Carbonite is bound to be pretty low at this point. This isn't a new Star Wars experience. It's a tourist trap grasping at the shadows of past greatness. Kay was so dumbfounded over someone she doesn't know frozen in Carbonite that she missed Jabba and all of his guards hiding a foot or two in the shadows. They all somehow tracked Kay to Tatooine, found Haas, who she didn't even know Kay was looking for, and he informed her that Kay was headed to Jabba's, which led to this trap where she assumed Jabba wouldn't kill Kay and gets kicked into the Rancor pit behind her when she tries to intervene. Jabba's Rancor pit is a bit different from what I recall from Return of the Jedi. The Rancor isn't even here. Instead, it's two monster hounds who eat Haas. The Rancor seems to have free range of the place, only attacking them once they reach the front entrance of Jabba's palace. Since they can't kill the Rancor before Luke shows up to do it, they're stuck knocking it out, after which Jabba's men surround them and take them right back to Jabba's hookah chamber. Can you guess what his response is going to be? If you pick, Jabba is so amused by their escape attempt that he's willing to let Kay and Vel do a job for them in exchange for their freedom, then you were good enough to write this game. I swear to God there isn't a single interaction that you can't see coming from a mile away. Zarek Besh placed a spy inside Jabba's operation. He wants the two of them to infiltrate the Bestine compound to discover who it is, which means it's time to sneak into another Imperial base and hack a computer. The agent I planted in your ranks is dead, I presume. Work with me, 
And I can help you take that palace for yourself one day. Do haku jijama. Didu banaga tuta genulia tis grani pagua. Tell me what you know about K Vess. Slero placed a mole inside Java's palace because he knew they would find out, somehow knew Kay would show up here, and knew Java would send Kay to find info and expose the spy. Also, Slero could tempt Fortuna with an offer of an alliance in exchange for info on Kay Vess. Info Fortuna doesn't even have, since he only knows her name and that's it. Slero never even does anything with whatever he learned from Fortuna. The game just wanted to remind you that he's looking for Kay. Initiate Project Deadfall. <laughs> Three, nine. In 5 begins glitching. Incongruently, so does the game, since his blaster is fused to his hand and pointed sideways. Gadink's friend Timon knows of an old droid factory from the Clone Wars under his house, where they might be able to repair Indy before he shuts down for good. They come across Timon once again about to be killed by a hired gun, this time one who's looking for Kay since he somehow knows Timon worked on her speeder. It's surprisingly easy to track people down with zero leads in this galaxy. Gadeek makes it seem really hard to repair a Clone War commando droid. I recall C-3PO being cut into pieces in the old films and being repaired no problem. And C-3PO was an older model than ND5, predating the Clone War droids by over a decade. Gadeek's fusion cutter can cut four separate points by cutting only the top two corners. Uh, I can hear someone else down here, Kay. We were followed. If someone followed you down here, doesn't that mean your friend Timon is dead, since the only entrance was under his house? You gotta be kidding me. And this is supposed to be a secret base. And you need to get out of my way. There are rebels using this droid factory as a hidden base. And not just any rebels, but the 2K interacted with back at Slero's vault. This is an awfully small galaxy. You know, I came here looking for your help, but uh, looks like you might need mine. You came here looking for Kay's help, but she came here. And you guys were already based here when Gadeek and Indy stumbled upon you. And why would you want Kay to help you when you know nothing about her and your friend left her to die inside Slero's vault? What do you need? The Hats captured one of our teams. They're gonna sell them to the Empire. You help my friends, and uh, I'll help yours. You already owe her your life, and you had the audacity to demand that she help rescue more captured rebels before you'll repair ND. You know, you don't need to knock Kay out to have a reason for a flashback. Hey, Kay. We need two slicers, right? Well, here's the best of the best. Jalen decided to be responsible for the one member of the team he didn't task K with recruiting. The guy needed someone who would be on his side when he pulled the rug out from under all of them, and somehow landed on K's mother of all people, and surprisingly she agreed. Jalen also brought on Asara to replace Haas, so that makes two people who failed to steal from Slero's vault of this man is hired. You know Slero's mansion better than any of us, so it should be no surprise we'll need his master key of passcodes, always kept on his person. I've got word he's brokering some deal between Zarek Besh and the Empire's intelligence outfit, the ISB. Infiltrate the meat, get the key, and regroup with the crew on Kanto. I'm sure this one will be different from all the other Imperial bases I've done the same exact thing in. I see you still have my blaster. You know, that power pack is aftermarket. It overheats easy. I fixed that years ago. You did? Because it still overheats after just a few shots. Slero's meeting with some imps on an ISB station. Tightest security in the galaxy. This ISB station has the tightest security in the galaxy, but only needs the two of you to sneak in and steal Slero's keys. But Slero's vault requires an entire team of specialists. <laughs> we? Uh, no. No, me and Nyx got this. <sighs> Can he pilot an Imperial shuttle? She learned to fly the Trailblazer on the go and mastered it by her second flight. I think she can handle an Imperial shuttle. The best moment in any Ubisoft game is hands down this message about the point of no return. It's almost over. All you need to do is fly an old Imperial shuttle that was likely registered as stolen and you can land at one of their stations. No passcodes, no clearance, no inspections. Just set her down in the hangar and you're good to go. Even though we're in the end game, this is only the second to last Imperial base you'll be sneaking through. Slero directing the ISB doesn't really change anything. He wasn't accomplishing much pretending to be a criminal syndicate leader. His plan was to establish a crime syndicate that would search for rebels working in the underworld. But he found none, and spent all of his time looking for a non-rebel affiliated outlaw who stole an old ship from him. Well, this is a surprise.
If you're going to make your game about outlaws in the Star Wars universe, it's in your best interest to not include Darth Vader in it. Not only does it show a lack of confidence in your own narrative and characters, but its presence adds an air of significance to what is honestly a pretty insignificant plot. It sucks the air out of the room because you expect Vader to only be present for something truly important. But here, he raises the stakes without increasing the tension for anyone but Slero, not the heroine, since Darth Vader is only here to dress him down for failing to find any rebels. Kay and Rico fly to Kanto on the Imperial shuttle, but the others flew there on the Trailblazer. Wouldn't landing the Trailblazer on Kanto be risky? This is where Kay stole his ship from, and Slero has been chasing her around the galaxy over it ever since, and it's a one of a kind. Someone at the spaceport would likely recognize it. Zarek Besh? It's an Imperial front. Slero's ISB. Walk away now, and you say goodbye to 157 million credits. You knew, didn't you? Would you be here if I told you? Do you have any idea how many Imperial bases Kay has snuck into at this point? Jalen's excuse for not telling Kay that Zarek Besh was an Imperial front doesn't hold up that well when faced with how ineffective the Empire is. If the ISB is so bad, why has Slero struggled to find Kay? Last time I tried this, I realized security's weak spot is the hangar. These codes get us access to the ventilation system. Slero's vaults are blocked by those energy gates. Nothing a pair of slicers can't handle. As soon as the gates are down, these automated turrets kick in. I'll secure our exit through the casino and hide in plain sight. TT-8L droid protecting the vault is the best money can buy. But I'm better. Mm. Vault protected by chromium time locks can't be sliced. Tagua kutis patisa kava blasto no viha no lia. They go over the heist and everyone chimes in with their part of the plan that they were brought on to deal with like we don't already know. After the job's done, your death mark will be gone. How would this job get rid of Kay's death mark? Wouldn't it only increase it since she's stealing from Slero again? They have to first hit a security checkpoint before entering the casino. I wouldn't think a firefight would give away the entire operation, but all the security guards never radio in the situation. The heist goes well until they're about to open the vault when Slero and Vale show up. Apparently they knew Kay would be hitting the vault tonight without ever learning about the heist plan and prepared for it by posting no additional security, letting them get all the way to the vault, and didn't even move the important stuff inside the vault to a different location. Vale turns on Slero because he's been a bit overbearing to her, an attitude I would expect she deals with a lot in the contract bounty hunting business. You never see anyone reasonable or fair placing a bounty on someone's head. There's nowhere in the galaxy you can hide from the ISB. Last thing I need is a dead ISB director. So you'd prefer a pissed off one who has every reason to target you and your friends and family? Casino's just ahead. Okay, Ank, Gadeek. It's time to split up. Why wouldn't Kay and Rico take the hall in the same direction that Gadeek and Ank are going, since those two can't escape to the casino with them? Their path out is apparently way easier by floating up the waterway. Meanwhile, Kay has to fight her way out through the casino floor. Gross panels open, Kay. Blast it! Ah, uh, the old standby of placing the power source in the same room with your energy barrier. Uh, where's our hall? This is better. Is there a data bank? Imperial clearance codes? Operational planning, base schematics. And Slero's personal collection of blackmail on almost every ranking officer in the Empire. There are no credits inside the hall. Instead, it's a codex full of sensitive Imperial data, making this the second AAA Star Wars game I played in the last few years with a plot focused on a holocron full of information that will be inconsequential. Just how many times are you going to make a space Excel spreadsheet out to be of grave importance? Jalen is going to make a deal with the Empire, turning over the Codex and Asara's rebel base in exchange for control of Slero's Zarek Besh Syndicate. And Rico made a deal with Jalen to protect Kay. Her death mark would be removed and she'd be free to go. But Kay wants no part of it and is knocked unconscious. But when she wakes up, the casino chip Rico left with Kay as a child, something we only learned about in the flashback right after Indy Thunder, starts beeping an Ink and Gadeek rescue her. Rico gave them her Imperial shuttle and the tracking device for the casino chip, and they managed to sneak on board a Star Destroyer with it, despite neither of them being pilots as far as I know. I guess piloting an Imperial shuttle wasn't as hard as Rico made it out to be. Why didn't Rico tag along if she actually cared that much about Kay's safety? She struck up a deal with Jalen to keep Kay safe, but didn't take Kay with her when she left, instead letting Jalen stuff her inside an escape pod and fly the trailblazer to a Star Destroyer. She clearly knew Kay needed rescuing at that point. Why else would she have given her shuttle and tracker to Gadeek and Ink? Kay won't leave Indy behind under Jalen's control, so Gadeek gives her a freedom spike to disable his restraining bolt and Kay dons a stormtrooper uniform to walk around the ship, which means we could have been doing this in every previous Imperial base. Apparently being short is no longer a dead giveaway for a fake stormtrooper. Director Basha, 
I understand there has been a security breach. Darth Vader appeared for exactly three minutes of human resource lectures before allowing the JD Vance of sci-fi to unceremoniously off Slero. Jalen and Slero are brothers. Slero is jealous of Jalen being the heir and favorite of the rich family of shipbuilders on Corellia, so sent a commando droid to kill all of his family and somehow worked his way into the Empire to become director of the ISB after that. But Jalen survived and took control of ND. There's no real sin here, except for being boring. I'm only mentioning it so you understand the all too predictable plot. K has to run through a now weirdly empty Star Destroyer. His place was packed with staff on the way here. But now, while ND is blasting everything in sight and K is powering up a generator to stun him, there's no one around. Indy grabs Kay before she can ram the freedom spike into his restraining bolt. But Nyx arrives, even though Kay left him back on the trailblazer, and tosses Kay her blaster, which works just as well as a freedom spike, since after she shoots Indy in the chest, he kills Jalen. The lunch break must have ended, because they have to fight their way out of the Star Destroyer now. Jalen had already handed over the location of the rebel base on Akiba, and Asara is having trouble reaching them over the radio. It's a base with a dozen people. Would the Empire really send an entire Star Destroyer to deal with such a small rebel faction when they already have plenty of forces on that planet who could assault it? K decides to fight a Star Destroyer and her trailblazer instead of fleeing and puts out a distress beacon to call for help. This beacon will bring in help from one of the crime syndicates she's in good standing with. In my game, it was the Ashiga clan. An odd one since I sided with the Queen and she's in an alliance with the Empire. Even Jabba the Hutt will send help if you're friends with him, which makes even less sense. I waited until the very end to bring up the space combat, mainly due to it having zero impact on the game except for hiding the loading between planets. You rarely have a good reason to fly around in orbit, and the space combat is pretty terrible too, as evidenced by my strategy for destroying turrets on the Star Destroyer by flying face first into their flat cannon, parking there, taking every hit while shooting it at point blank range, and somehow winning. Any goddamn day now. How much loading do you need to hide behind those repeated animations? Then, did you get out? You can say that. Asara didn't even tell the rebels where the Star Destroyer was. He just wanted them to evacuate the base, but they show up to the fight as well. What I've pulled from the Codex, Jalen was right. We can't tip the scales against the Empire. Sure you will, buddy. I'm sure whatever was in it will be extremely valuable. Wondering when you'd show up? I wasn't. I completely forgot about her after she stayed behind in the vault. The only reason one of the syndicates came to Kay's rescue against the Star Destroyer was for possession of the Codex, which Kay just handed over to Vale so she can start her own syndicate and allowed Asara to copy all the information it contained for the Rebels, making its contents far less valuable. This should result in whichever syndicate risked everything to save Kay's neck, placing a new death mark on her. The end credit scene is user wrap up one final point. Rico was caught by the Empire when using the fake credits Jaden paid her. In case Samil knows about it, and snuck in disguise as an officer just so she could tell her mom that she knew about the tracking chip she placed inside the casino chip, also she could always know where her daughter was. Not that she ever did anything with that information. She still left her daughter on a dangerous planet with no support, and never got involved with her until she had a death mark on her. But that was enough for Kay to hand her the key to escape. Thanks for watching the video. If you liked it, be sure to like and subscribe. Maybe even leave a comment for me down below about how stupid you think I am, or how I didn't even play the game even though I have live stream footage of me playing it. But I'm done with Star Wars now and it's off to much more interesting games for October. So be sure to vote for which of these two horror games you would like to see me sin next. We can pretend for a moment that Alan Wake 2 stands any chance of winning over Silent Hill 2. And speaking of Silent Hill, did you know I've sinned Silent Hill 1 and 3 exclusively on my Patreon as part of the Classic Sin series? You can go check them out by becoming a member. Plus get access to more exclusive videos like my upcoming Sin video on Hideo Kojima's Snatcher and Mortal Kombat DLC. Special thanks this month to Alexander Q. Cortez, Ben, Roman Are You Sleeping, Nervous Nelly, Xavier Distalis, Notorious SKP, Max Headroom, DJ Nelson, Azanith the Succubus, Musical Pumpkin, Castle Mania, Zinro, Michelle C, Yaroslav Gulabev, Dennis O'Brien, Malrose, Jake B, Donald Talbot, Saint Plays, Montezuma, Aaron Hines, Sky is Under, Eric Kisser, Shadow Wolf Gaming, Purple Jaeger, Church Kiones, Storm Queen Suki, S Venus, Mario Neto, Ben Hottie, The Butcher X, and Charmsy. And a big thanks to all the patrons and viewers as well.